It's your table. This is my table. Okay, just making sure what's what here. We go to the right. <laughs> everybody. Welcome to uh, Africa's Heat Map. My name is Matt Murray. I'm the foreign editor of the Wall Street Journal. It's good to see a crowded room and I think we're going to have a lively discussion today. We have a terrific panel of uh, people who every day think about what investment decisions to make across the continent and uh, we'll be hearing from all of them, I hope. The hope this morning is to have a uh, lively discussion and I would ask uh, as we start for everybody to uh, be concise and to the point, uh, to be respectful as people are speaking. Our hope is to have a good discussion. Uh, we're happy to take questions as we go from those of you out there. I just raise your hand and I think we've got people out there who can, uh, can uh, tap you. Uh, when you ask a question, please give your name and identify your affiliation. Uh, we'll talk for a while. We'll also have a, a time dedicated specifically to questions. Uh, as we get later on in the panel. So thank you very much. Let me just introduce everybody who's with us today. Uh, Martin Davies, uh, to my immediate left, is uh, I think well known to anybody who's following events in Africa. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Frontier Advisory. He's a young global leader with WEF. Uh, he's done a lot of extensive work in Africa, China, really around the world, I think it's fair to say, right at this point, Martin. Um, next to uh, Martin is uh, Jeff uh, White. He is the Chief Executive uh, uh, Officer and uh, Director of uh, Lawn Row from the UK. They have extensive business interests across the, the, the continent. Uh, and you were saying you spent about three weeks out of every month here in the last month in London, right? So I think you, uh, he's been around uh, quite a bit. Yvonne Eich uh, uh, is the CEO of, uh, for West Africa of the Renaissance Group. Uh, she has more than, she has about, you have about two decades in financial services, really, worked a long time at J.P. Morgan, have been in New York, Geneva, Hong Kong, all over the place. Jay Ireland, uh, for the last year or so, has been running a GE Africa for General Electric. You've also got extensive experience at the company at NBC and uh, GE Capital and other businesses. And at the end, uh, Michael Mashari is the founder and group CEO for Seven Seas Technologies, based in Kenya, but also working across the continent. Great panel, thank you all for being here. Uh, Martin, uh, you've got a good continent-wide view of what's hot, uh, what markets are doing well, so can you give us a big overview of where we are in 2012 at a time when Europe is slowing uh, badly, China has slowed a bit. What, how do you look at the continent? What do you see as the growth areas, and what do you see as the risk factors? Matt, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I would argue, and maybe be slightly provocative first, is. This is not so much um, country-driven as it is sector-driven and consumer-capturing-driven, with very few exceptions. I would argue that unlike Asia, for example, not just countries but also cities, African countries are not doing enough to compete for capital. Um, we'll start to see that going forward, but I think medium term, the trend will be start seeing African cities compete for capital as hubs for investment. We're not seeing that yet. I think the, we're starting to see a few countries which are differentiating themselves in terms of what I call agile states. Um, top of the list for me would be countries like Rwanda. Uh, Mauritius not being a mainland economy, but certainly. Uh, perhaps Ghana would be there. And I'd also, I'm not just saying because I'm here, but Ethiopia as well. Um, the two fastest growing economies, looking at a country thing now, is uh, Ethiopia and, Ang and Angola. One is resource very rich, one is resource relatively poor. Both are the, s the two largest recipients of infrastructure finance from China on the continent. Perhaps there's something to, to delve deeper into, into there. I think um, another thing, I mentioned initially, the need for states to compete for capital uh, far more. What stifles this competition, and we had a, um, 
a session yesterday about this, was on the metals and mining discussion yesterday morning. And, and I get very frustrated when I hear um, ministers, um, government officials talk about the need for harmonization, the need for centralized codes, for standard African practice. This appeals politically, but commercially, economically, what it does is start to reduce competition because the countries are not differentiating themselves, they're rather centralizing policy, largely often around dysfunctional institutions. This is not going to result in a differentiation for their sectors, for their countries, for capital, ultimately. And I think that's a mistake. Um, risks, uh, so one other thing on hotspots, often, you know, generally most of us would agree that the majority of borders on this continent are artificial. In similar sense, then, the economies within those borders are somewhat artificial. What I mean by that is that um, we, the hotspots should not be defined by the countries, but rather where the actual economic activity is taking place. An economy, for example, you could call be Namgola, northern sort of Namibia, southern Angola. That's the hotspot. We see South African uh, retail giants setting up on the Namibian side of the border, but most of the customers are Angolans. Similar trend between South Africa, Mozambique, and many others. So the hotspots are not country-defined, but rather the economy actually is at border posts, and often it's project-driven as well. Last point on risk is risk going forward, I think. Um, we talk about the new Africa, and the, the permeating theme throughout, throughout this whole forum meeting is the new Africa, a positive Africa. Through an economic lens, yes. Through a political lens, no. I think politics in Africa is the, um, is the, the fundamental challenge, <coughs> political management, uh, that needs to be addressed going forward. The second risk potentially is um, China relative slowdown, China's political change in December. China, by some counts, is the largest single private investor, lender, um, financing infrastructure in Africa. Is that a risk in terms of policy change out of Beijing going forward? Perhaps not, but it has been discussed. I want to ask Yvonne, you, you think about investment. Do you, what do you think of this competition among countries idea that Martin has laid down somewhat provocatively compared to the sort of pan-African approach? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. To tell me how you feel about, Martin has laid out somewhat provocatively the thought of countries competing compared to a pan-African approach. Do you think that's wise? Is that a way to spur development and FDI more quickly? Um, I would actually, actually disagree. I think that the, com the countries within Africa need to collaborate, not in the, politically way, in the political way that you, the central policy way that you outlined. I, I think that doesn't work. Right. But certainly the, the resource-rich countries or the countries that have uh, areas of collaboration take, for example, Ethiopia is talking to Nigeria about creating com a commodities exchange. And that there should, so there should be more collaboration and synergies because if you look at what Ethio Ethiopia, which is a relatively resource poor country, has done in terms of agriculture and trading, and if they can take some of that and combine it with the agriculture potential in Nigeria, we start to, the focus on synergies is far more important for the development of Africa than to have African countries com competing against each other. And I do think that as we look at the trends for FDI, we should be looking to have the Western and developed countries competing to invest in the more interesting commercially viable spots in Africa. We've got a couple of uh, folks here who every day think about where in Africa to go and not go. And Jay and Jeff, I'd like to bring you in. and ask you in the context of sort of a competition versus collaboration, how do you think about where to go in Africa and, <coughs> and how do you see your, what decisions you make in that context? <coughs> Can you weigh in here a little bit? Go ahead, Jeff. Um, I think from, from our perspective, I think uh, investment opportunities are still very project for, focused. So it's where you see an opportunity. Um, we, as Lonro, we work in 18 countries across the continent. Mm -hmm. Um, there's obviously countries that we, we have a, a lower threshold to invest in and are more comfortable investing in, but we're still very focused at what's the opportunity and uh, what's the market for what we're investing in, where's that market going to come from, and uh, it's very project-related as opposed to necessarily looking at uh, so, geographical so boundaries. When you think about those 18 countries, what are your sort of minimal 
uh, things you're looking for in an environment to go in that tells you this is a friendly climate for us? I, I think, I mean, from, from an investment perspective, we, I mean, on a macro level, we're very focused on what we see as the economic drivers of Africa. Mm. We think that uh, Africa's economy is driving because of mineral resources, because of oil and gas, and because of agriculture. So every industry, every business we have within, within our conglomerate are all focused to serving those three growth areas. And as a consequence of those three growth areas, you then get this huge consumer boom that's coming, mm. where McKinsey's saying you'll have $1.6 trillion of consumer spending by 2020. Um, and that consumer market is real when on the ground. So you almost have the three drivers of African growth, oil, gas, agriculture, and minerals. And then you've got the consumer opportunity that's being developed as a part of those industries being developed. Jay, you're in 16 countries. So what do those 16 countries have in common for you? I think um, we look at it from a couple of different ways. We're, we're an infrastructure company. Uh, across healthcare, aviation, oil and gas, uh, power generation, uh, transportation, locomotives. Uh, so for us, most of what we sell, pretty much everyone needs. And so what we look at is a combination of the country's potential growth, what the, what the size of it is, the political stability, because most of everything we sell is to a government or a government agency or a parastatal. Uh, and then how, how ease of doing business, I guess, for lack of a better term. And then I think, again, from a standpoint of earlier on the regional aspect, <clears throat> we're, I'm responsible for sub-Saharan Africa, so there's 48 countries. We are not going to be able to do 48 GE country. So we've got to figure out a regional play. So are there, can we work with the East African community to put something in Rwanda that can support Kenya or Kenya into Tanzania or <clears throat> in the south would, you know, and, and the countries there typically want you to invest. There's a, a broader request for investment, but you can't put everything in the big countries to serve the small countries. Mm -hmm. It's got to be if these regional cooperations are going to work, it has to be kind of a two-way street. So we're working with some governments around that and what we can do. But so we, we look at it both from a regional perspective of what the potential might be, as well as a, a combination of risk reward factors. Uh, from a standpoint of where we, would, where we would invest. The nicest thing would be to be able to come in, sell a turbine or a locomotive on credit to somebody, like a Duke Energy we do in the U.S. or whatever, but that's not going to happen here. We've got to put together a financing package. We have to put it together an engineering package. They typically would like us to lead a consortium, which isn't really our business, but we do that. So the solution sell here is a lot bigger deal. So w that ease of doing business and working with countries is important. To some extent, what you describe in sort of the collaboration versus competition theme is a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, there is competition because you're looking country by country, but then when you get in, it sounds like you'd like there, like there to be some regional effect as you go in in, in most of these places. Absolutely. I, when you, right now, there is a com this competition to a degree. In reality, I think there's enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. There aren't enough ports. There aren't enough railroads. There aren't enough ways to get goods from in inside to the ports and from the ports to inside. Uh, every country's infrastructure needs help from that perspective. They have to court, you know, you can't necessarily take a rail, you can't take a locomotive from South Africa to Kenya. You know, so there's a lot of logistical uh, challenges that are there that if we could work together and not in cooperation, the countries, you'd, you'd open up quite a bit of uh, potential. I want to bring Michael into the discussion and I'd, I'd like, um, in the context of what you've been talking about, uh, what are the, our session is Africa's heat map. So what are the hottest places in Africa right now for FDI, do you think, either geographically or sector-wise? Where, where's the action happening? Okay, I think look at our business here, in our technology business. So all, all sectors require technology. So I look at the, first from, a tech, from, a, from the sectors that need our services. And one of the areas, some of the seven sectors is agriculture. Uh, mining, uh, we look at telecommunications, we look at uh, banking and financial services, we look at uh, consumer goods, we look at infrastructure and oil and gas. And in, in all those sectors, in different parts of Africa, technology is a fundamental part. So from a heat map point of view, if I go to agriculture, definitely agri technology plays a fundamental role in agriculture, and agriculture in areas like Nigeria, in areas like uh, 
uh, Kenya, agriculture is a fundamental, uh, plays a fundamental role. Recently, one of, the, one of our, my tech uh, colleagues uh, managed to develop a technology platform that is able to distribute fertilizer in Nigeria using mobile commerce, because agriculture is a funda fundamental part. That alone is an opportunity for entrepreneurs in technology to be able to play a role. You look at banking, for instance, looking at channels, integrated channels, innovative channels. Banks are beginning to say we need to get more access to, 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 um, uh, to the citizens or to customers. But technology then plays a very fundamental role. Banks are doing mergers and acquisitions as they merge and get into, into, into the markets. They begin to find that technology fundamentally plays a key role in terms of integration. You look at infrastructure. Infrastructure, you look at roads. We've got massive roads coming up, ports, railways. Technology, again, plays a fundamental role. And you're coming from a situation where most of these infrastructure projects are greenfield. So technology, fundamentally, at the, at the heart of these projects, plays a very fundamental uh, element in that. Oil and gas, Angola, Nigeria, oil and gas, today if you look at Nigeria and Angola, technology companies in there playing a fundamental role because technology is at the heart of business operations in those, in those markets. So from a heat map, what I see is that in all those sectors I talked about, technology is fundamental. For us as a business, we look at, we go to areas where we feel those five sectors are thriving. Some could thrive now, others could thrive tomorrow, but ultimately you need to be able to address uh, address companies like GE, companies like Londra and the rest of the global companies move, move into those markets to build those infrastructures or we need to see how do we fit in in those, in those fundamental areas. So the heat map is again dependent on those five, seven sectors I talked about. Let me ask about um, several of you, if anyone wants to jump in, you might have thoughts, Jay or, or Jeff or I know uh, Yvonne, you might as well. What about manufacturing? I mean, when people talk about the industries in Africa and the hot sectors, manufacturing tends not to be one there. And of course, one of the issues is creating jobs in Africa and helping with uh, employment here. How do you, do you see signs? Does anybody speak to, can anyone speak to manufacturing prospects? I mean, you know, I was thinking about GE. Do you, how much do you uh, import to Africa? How much do you make yep. in Africa? Well, well, what we have a, uh, an assemb a locomotive assembly plant in uh, Pretoria, South Africa. Uh, we're, we're, we work with Transnet, <clears throat> and um, we manufacture right now about a, or assemble about 100 locomotives. We're probably around 50% local content, looking to go higher. Uh, and that model that we've done there, which has been there for, I don't know, four, four years or so, uh, is the ones that we're looking to expand, um, where, what we can do now. The issue in most other countries other than South Africa is it's hard to do manufacturing when you have no continuous power source and it goes out on you. It's hard to do manufacturing if you're requiring parts or, sh or ship shipping out or shipping in and it takes six weeks to get from the port to the factory because of customs delays, because of the lack of technology and some of the clearing. So those kind of things in the roads or how you transport things, so those also have to be addressed. Now, what we're looking at is obviously that model. The other model for us, which we have in Nigeria, is service shops, uh, where we basically make, uh, we, we assemble what we call Christmas trees in the oil and gas industry that work with the uh, exploration, and, um, and then also service shops for our turbines and things like that. So our goal is to really build out a service infrastructure um, with our products. I don't foresee any time soon that we're going to be making jet engines or or heavy-duty gas turbines in Africa, mm -hmm. um, but we can service them. We can continue to supply parts and, uh, and potentially make parts here. But again, a lot of that infrastructure is going to have to be taken care of, as well as training. We need a much broader focus on technical training across the continent. Uh, engineers are in short supply. Technical capability is in short supply. completely agree with Jay. Um, just to get it into perspective, Africa is, ha, accounts for about 4% of the power supply globally. So it's a very low number. And with the infrastructure challenges, et cetera, um, I, would, I would classify it as, uh, as a cold spot for Africa. And, and what that means, therefore, is that the, the, the initiatives around the cold spots in Africa are still very important, but there, in as much as I'm extremely pro-private sector, those are the areas where the government does need to um, step in, uh, play a high, higher role in the PPP structure, and make sure that 
um, the investment climate is, is, is appropriate for people to even come in, even on a PPP basis. Can I ask you one thing about this? Which, uh, to, to what extent, uh, Yvonne, do you think companies doing FDI here have some obligation to hire locally, to establish an African presence permanently? Do you, do you feel uh, that there's a social responsibility that comes for employers here? Um, I, I think the social responsibility, the responsibility aspect lies with the Africans. I think the Africans need to demand more for the from the corporates that come into Africa. Now, where we have investment hotspots where it makes sense for companies to come in, and I'll give a couple of examples, I do think that we should be working with those corporates, like you know all the companies we have here, Lonro, GE, etc., to say you come in and you do need to, the three things that we have challenges with, which are skills development. If you come in, we, will, we want to incentivize you to come with a program that comes with skills development. It comes with some level of capital and it tackles one of the sectors that we need to expand into. To the extent that they do that, we need to make, we need to help them improve their margins and make their lives more interesting. And this is not necessarily about reducing taxes to get the companies in. One way, there could be huge rebates or huge arrangements that are specifically tied to how much, the, how much overall revenue they've brought in or how much capital they've tr they can demonstrate that they've trained. And to the extent that they do that, they should be given quite big concessions for coming in, import duty reliefs, etc., for coming into the country. So I, so, so I think that does the that, responsibility does, does, does is on the that Africans. Does that happen, do you think? Is that something that um, you see? I, one area that? where it's been very successful, so there are two, I'll give you two perspectives. Uh, one of my favorite corporates in Africa is the Diageo Group. And what they do, without being prompted, they do come in and try to source, lo without being fully prompted, I should say. So they do have very strong local material programs. It works for them because it helps them with the logistics issues, it helps them with the importation tax duties and the FX exposure issues that they would otherwise run. Um, also, they w but they then take the risk of working with local farmers who, who, are not, who, who don't have the skills and do not have the infrastructure, but they work with them. Um, uh, one classic case is in Kenya where there's a very cheap alcohol that they were drinking uh, there that was actually causing health and mortality issues. They approached the government and said, reduce our import tax duties and we will give them a cheaper product, which was, was, it was able to demonstrate that health, health issues and mortality issues were improved. So there, 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 there can be a business case, but it's up to us Africans to say, we, this is what we want and, and to be considerate of the commercial arrangements that's required from it. Uh, on, the, on, the pub, on the public side, in Nigeria and in some of the markets, we have the local content bill where in the oil and gas sector, you do have to give Nigerian, like Nigerians do have first consideration from an employment perspective, financial services perspective, legal perspective, etc. It's, it's not perfect, but what it has done, you still have, a, the, the IOCs are still making a lot of money, yeah. and the, the Nigerian part of their business still accounts for a large chunk of their business. What it has done on the, locally, the skills development, the economic empowerment, and the capital inflows that have occurred because of that bill are phenomenal. Mm. And so we need to find more of these examples and encourage more of them. Did you want to weigh in? On yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's two distinct markets. One is manufacturing for the consumer boom that's going on in Africa mm -hmm. and supplying it into the African marketplace which is quite attractive, and we're investing in that. We've got a, a large manufacturing plant in Cape Town yeah. that makes prefabricated buildings and supplies it all over the continent to the oil companies, to mining companies, etc. And I think within, within a, 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 an African environment, you can manufacture and you can manufacture competitively, uh, given the import duties and the difficulties other people have of bringing in raw materials. I think for Africa to be a manufacturer to export and compete in global markets, is still very challenging. It is still the most expensive place in the world to deliver logistics, to bring in raw materials, to um, set up manufacturing plants using steel global materials to produce what you're producing, and then try and compete in the Africa in the global market is very very difficult. In the West Africa, we've just done a, a feasibility study. West Africa is still the most expensive place on the continent to land a 40-foot container um, and to get it distributed. 
But having said that, I think, A, you've got this consumer market growing, and there's opportunities to manufacture for them. And one of our, one of our major divisions, our agri-division, um, is doing lots of what I'd call quasi-manufacturing, where we're taking African produce, feeding it into that consumer market. But more and more, and I think is interesting in this context, more and more is doing growing programs and delivery to global retailers. So we're now taking tomatoes from Mozambique, from Zambia, from Zimbabwe, across southern Africa, and delivering them uh, into the Far East, into China, into the ASEAN marketplace. We supply African produce into the US marketplace, into all the European supermarkets. And what's interested in that is that that division within us now employs about 4,500 people, and the added value is done in Africa. So if you go into my facility in, in southern Africa, one day it looks like Tesco's, the next day it looks like Marks and Spencer's. And within Africa, we're date stamping it, pricing it. If they want it chopped and put with uh, onion and made into a fruit salad, we can do all that within Africa. And that's very different to maybe 10 years ago, where all Africa exported was whole fruit and veg off to the, off to the world, and then um, added value, chopping, packing, and everything was done outside of Africa. So that's now all that added value is now done within the continent. And I think you'll see more and more of that as, as the economy grows. Martin, let me come back to where you started and, and ask you, can you talk a, a little bit in the context of some of the decisions you, you, you're hearing uh, uh, the other panelists talk about where should it, when you talk about competition versus collaboration, where do you think states should compete and where should they collaborate? Are there differences? I think just stating is that um, I'll come to collaboration now, but, but ultimately a state's destiny, economic destiny, will be dependent on the soundness of its own policies and ability to implement those policies. I don't know one country that succeeded due to a regional policy and uh, Asia is a, a, prime, a prime case, where we should be collaborating, and this is not about creating additional layers of bureaucracy or, or very centralized, um, over-politicized institutions, but is obviously regional market integration. Look at South Africa, for example, or the region, Southern African Development Community, SADAC, 273-odd million people, I believe, 15 member countries. Uh, the institution of SADAC, based in Cabarone, has not been very effective in driving region integration. The last year or so, South Africa has joined the BRICS grouping, and we're very pleased about that. We're 50 million people. We're a mid-sized Indian state or a mid-sized Chinese province. The S in BRICS should ultimately stand for SADAC. 270-odd million people. We're bigger than Brazil. We're bigger than Russia. We're bigger than other potential members like Indonesia, uh, Vietnam perhaps, Turkey amongst others. The challenge is, is how do we start to get the mobility of, of, of goods, which was spoken to, particularly infrastructural you know, constraints around that, mobility of talent, mobility of capital, and really truly, truly building a, a regional economy. Uh, the most progressive region has been East Africa, certainly, and that means there's a lot of lessons that we can take down south from the, um, the East African integration experience. So I think that's where we should be focusing in the sort of Goldman Sachs view of the world through BRICS. Um, big is beautiful. The bigger market you have, the more attractive you are to capital. And as Jeff was saying around sort of the consumer story, that's what it's about beyond the resources. So who's getting it right right now? When you think of the heat map, who's the hottest on the heat map? Well, from an integration perspective, East Africa, definitely. Um, you know, you, you deal with the EAC based in, in Arusha, Tanzania. It's an effective organization. Um, simple things, they respond to emails on a daily basis, which, which is a good start. Um, so I think the East Africans, and truly now from a regional perspective in Africa, the highest growth rate as a region is coming from East Africa. Yeah. It's liberalization in Kenya, uh, it's the sort of dynamism and the focus of, of Rwandans, it's, it's oil and gas, or oil discovery in, in, in Uganda, it's Tanzania sort of ticking along. M a lot more could be done around infrastructure, of course, yeah. but from a policy level, the East Africans seemingly are, are leading the way. Do you, does everybody here agree, or are there other thoughts anyone would like to add? About I, th I think I would have to say, I mean, again, it's it's... Um, there's an element of regionality about it, but there's definitely countries that are leading. And uh, countries you go back to, countries that have got oil revenue coming in, and um, uh, countries that have started uh, exporting agricultural produce, uh, countries that have big mineral wealth are seeing strong economic growth. 
Um, I think somewhere like Tanzania, for example, is, is a win-win. I mean, they've got huge gas fines offshore that are going to be massively significant in the future of the economy. They are doing very, very important agricultural work in boosting their agricultural production capabilities, and not just for a domestic market, but for an export market. And I think when, when, uh, when you have those sort of economic stimuluses, you get this sort of change of balance where the, the world and the world's supermarkets and the world's uh, China and the world's oil and gas uh, requirements become more dependent on Africa as a solution mm -hmm. rather than historically Africa has always been dependent on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And the balance is slowly but, but really tangibly <coughs> changing where, I mean, we were sitting with one of the biggest retailers in the world who said, no, no, we've got a whole list of produce that we need to source from Africa because we know that in five years our shelves will be empty if we don't engage with African agriculture. And that's them coming to Africa rather than the other way around. Uh, I, I agree with, uh, with that on East Africa. It's one of the reasons um, we, we decided to put our African headquarters in Nairobi versus Joburg, which everybody thought we should do. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think part of it may be in that, especially when you compare it to the West, maybe not as much to the South, it's not a very resource rich area. So they've had to grow economies through other means and cooperation has helped them. And I think maybe that's some of the drivers behind it, especially when you consider it versus the West, the West where there's a lot of oil and, and uh, natural resources. And so I think, you know, th that dynamic, and, and the key is, Again, as I said earlier, is there's give and take. You've got big countries, small countries, you've got ones that are landlocked, ones that have ports, et cetera. So the cooperation is critical uh, for the growth of the whole area. And again, it, it leverages, as Martin said, like the South, 273 versus 40. I think it's 150 versus you know, 40 for Kenya versus East Africa. Well, I think that's an interesting uh, point. And I, and, I, and I wonder to what extent I mean, obviously, the energy boom, the commodities boom, is very good to Africa right now and bringing in a lot of growth and development. Are there degrees to which it's an inhibitor of economic development because uh, the commodities are there? Uh, when uh, you know uh, what you said is very interesting, Jay, about um, the East Africans having to find other ways to get for their economic growth, perhaps propelling them forward. Um, I think two other things in East Africa: you got two of the fastest growing airlines. <laughs> Ethiopian and Kenya Airways, and they want to they want to be uh, intra Africa um, carriers. Where you know, and I think you know, when you look at the West, there's really no main carrier out there. Uh, out there, so I think it's a now you have South Africa Airways, uh, mm -hmm. SAA, but I mean, there's a big competition right now to be who's going to be the carrier for intra Africa, mm -hmm. especially serving a lot of the smaller countries. So I think. You know, and that, I think that's the mindset they have of cooperation, and so I don't know, maybe that is part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, on your question about whether commodities is, a, is an inhibitor, um, I wouldn't call it an inhibitor. It does, it does however, create, present challenges for sustainability mm -hmm. in terms of sustained growth, and also challenges for uh, closing the gap between economic growth and development within Africa. So by development, I mean reduced Health, uh, unemployment, health care, uh, economic, economic growth for the people, etc. So countries that are living on like next to nothing. Insofar as you have uh, just those, commod those uh, the reliance of, on the commodities for growth, uh, we, we're challenged with the, the wealth and the growth going into the other parts of the economies. I think uh, from, a, from, a, from an East Africa point of view, one of the sectors that are sort of uh, championed uh, growth across Africa is telecoms industry. I think we've seen what the telecoms industry in our East Africa has done. We've seen changes in uh, how telecoms industry has driven financial services, mm -hmm. how the telecom industry is driven, driving uh, healthcare, agriculture. An example is uh, mobile health. Uh, in East Africa, for instance, one of the op mobile operators has introduced something called dial a doctor, dial a doctor service. This kind of service where you dial in, and immediately you have access to a doctor, mm. meaning that the the, the 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 citizen is not able to to have access to medical services, but then you have access to a doctor. Now that is innovation, innovation that can again be replicated across 
across across other markets. In the mobile money industry, you know what has happened. It is probably uh, challenged the way the financial services sector is working in our market. Mm. Then we've then taken that and, and replicated that across other parts of Africa today or the world. Today you look at 10 or 20 percent of all mobile users in the world, mobile money users in the world, are going to be from East Africa. Mm. That again gives you uh, a growth area. In terms of agriculture, the, in, in, in agriculture there's something like MFAM pro projects that have been uh, technologies that have come up that are driving and helping farmers be able to know the price of their produce. Now, this in the back of office has also been, been able to drive innovation and talent. So you have uh, something we are referring to as a silicon savanna. Silicon savanna where we're beginning to be seen as East Africa as a platform in which uh, technology, the next, the next uh, Silicon Valley is going to come from in Africa, mm -hmm. whereby now the ecosystem of talent is beginning to emerge, whereby you're beginning be the, with the connectivity and innovation and technology and data you're able to create a whole new breed of entrepreneurs who are then able to develop the next applications that are going to drive, are going to drive change and also be able to solve problems, practical problems in Africa. So that is also something else that the East Africans have done well mm. in terms of re leveraging this across Africa. Michael's company has been a, a real pioneer in this area. And when you look at, I think, two things that technology does, one in, in the business we're in, which is healthcare, which is, you know, it's dial a doctor, but we're also working with, these, with the providers can we get images from a rural area back into an urban area where there are radiologists that can read them, et cetera? So we're working from a telehealth standpoint as well. But I think the other thing, which is one of the bigger changes that occurs on this leapfrog, is that in the banking sector, when you talk to traditional bankers, they talk about Kenya being an unbanked economy because there aren't that many people that have bank accounts. The reason is they all have it on their phone right. with M-Pesa. So, so when you think about that from an industry perspective, you've got to think how, how are you going to reach that banking population differently than the traditional savings accounts, checking accounts, going to an ATM. And I think that's something that we all have to do as we, we look at Africa. What are the new models that, you know, that won't, the old models that worked in the developed countries aren't going to work? Are there, work other, are there other interesting technology-driven new models like the banking one as you go through Africa that stand out? I mean, is, is, that, is there stuff that's being promoted, like the doctor, is that from within Africa, or is that outsiders bringing in the ideas? I mean, any thoughts on other, other areas where a fresh approach helps? Just a, a very brief point in supporting what was said now is that there's two things. The headline last year for me in the newspaper, in South Africa's Business Day newspaper, was Africa has... 616 million mobile phone subscribers, larger than North America. That was the headline, and that's unbelievable. And of course, this has enabled all of this technology, but the uh, word I want to uh, pick up on is talent, mm -hmm. is going back five years or so at World Economic Forum in Cape Town, we launched a thing called the African Association of Business Schools. Just bear with me for a second. About 18, 19 business schools, about half of those, this is sub-Sahara, grouping of business schools, but half of those are in South Africa, the others in Sub-Sahara. <coughs> the developmental failure of this continent the last half century has been the inability to generate intellectual property and commercialize it. Right now, we have effectively nine business schools servicing a population of approximately 700 million people. Nine business schools. China would have, I'm guessing, maybe 3,000 or more. <laughs> India, something Growing similar. We have nine, nine business schools servicing a population of approaching three quarters of a billion people. To make this entire growth story sustainable of this continent, you mentioned, uh, Jeff, particularly about the sort of enabling environment from the resources, trickle down into consumers. We have to generate talent. We have to create institutions to generate talent to truly make it sustainable. So if a young African has an idea that seems promising as an entrepreneur, do you have a climate even in East Africa where that idea can come to fruition or is it, you know, are there just obstacles or challenges or is there not a climate of thinking about ideas that way or all those things? I think it's, um, I was very fortunate recently to be in the Africa conference in MIT mm. and most of, the, most of the kids there were, were, were from Senegal, from Kenya, a large number from Nigeria, a few from South Africa. And what struck me was just the entrepreneurial drive of these students and being in the sort of enabling environment what the US provides for that drive. Mm -hmm. It's very different what we have back home in many instances. It's about sort of young talent being entrepreneurial. How do we create that sort of, that's what's, that's, that's going to make all of it sustainable. Mm 
Michael, you were talking. One more thing is uh, is uh, looking at uh, looking at intellectual property. Billion, what David said uh, that we have we have opportunities, we have challenges, we have bright minds, entrepreneurial minds. Now, we unfortunately in Africa, and we we're trying to build this across Af in Kenya. One of the challenges is intellectual property, and how do you ring fence intellectual property such that the new currency for tomorrow is knowledge? Now, how do we take our problems, build solutions around them? ring fence them with, with intellectual property, ensure that the laws and legislations we have across our markets protect these kind of innovations. Because these innovations then can then be replicated across multiple continents. If you look at mobile money today, being implemented in Pakistan came from Kenya. So we're taking our problems, uh, seeing opportunities in those problems, ring fencing that, and then being able to replicate this in, in other markets. Now, for, for that, definitely, if you're looking at private equity or investors coming into Africa, investing in tech or investing in this kind of ideas, the, what, one of the assurances they want to, to know from you is how, do we sh how are we sure that the legal structure in this ca country protects you such that we're willing to put money in this idea, we're willing to back this idea, but we're not very sure that we can replicate this across other markets because of the, 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 the IP protection. So I, we are, one of the things we are driving constantly at the government level is to ensure that we're able to start protecting innovations that come out from different innovation hubs. And I think in Europe, in the US, this, is, this has been one of the areas where the new emerging companies across the world have been in tech. Companies that were able to ring fence their, their, their knowledge and then be able to go public in capital markets and create massive value. Today, look at Facebook. Facebook, we are buying shares on Facebook. Facebook, I'm sure 15 years ago, we probably most of the tech people in, on this panel have said, oh, who is Facebook? But today, Facebook probably is more worth than most of the companies on the table here. So that is the new era in terms of knowledge and wealth that we need to look at as Africans. Yvonne, does finance help here, and uh, African finance, or do they help entrepreneurs or not? Um, I, I was just going to say that the biggest in, uh, impediment for these young entrepreneurs is the lack of finance mm. and the lack of the legal protection. I think those two things together um, just hold back the development. Some of the solutions that we've seen so far is where you have countries um, uh, where they have specific funds for the for the most sort of specific funds to address technology development, uh, SME development, agriculture development, uh, and manufacturing as well. So, uh, if for example in Nigeria the central bank has worked together with the Bank of Industries to give seven percent loans over a long term, because the other thing with finance in Africa is it's very much short term based. International finance is short term because few people take a long term view on Africa and local financing is also short term. So the provision of long term financing at rates that are actually below inflation rates in some cases is, are some of the initiatives that are being put in place to fuel um, growth in that sector. One of the jobs we, we, we focus on and is to make sure that these entrepreneurs are aware of these initiatives and that's another area where we could work with other countries and regions to make sure that they're doing the same. Um, because the benefits are just... I, I, yeah, I think um, <clears throat> Yvonne touched on a topic which is key either in technology development <clears throat> and entrepreneurialism or even infrastructure projects. And that is a lack of vibrant capital markets here in the continent. And it's a combination of whether it's debt markets or, or equity. And I think part of it is, is that there, there's still so many industries that are still government controlled and government owned, I should say, more than controlled. And I think you know, that aspect of freeing up the ability to invest through a public capability rather than through government, or I should say private capability rather than through government. And I think that's one of the aspects because one of my prior roles was running our asset management company, managing the pension fund and all, and trying to invest in, in emerging markets, ex-China and India, especially Africa, was very difficult. The markets are thin, mm -hmm. and we need more companies listed, and most of the big companies that could carry a lot of weight are not our government owned, like I said. I think one of the great examples is Kenya Airways. You know, it's 50% owned by the public, 25% by the government, 25% by KLM and Air France. So they just did a rights issue to fund purchase of planes. That's the kind of dyna dynamic aspect has to happen, rather than let's just say a government control. They've got to take it out of the state budget to figure out how to finance something. Well, if I and if I've heard what some of you have said properly too, FDI here remains pretty project focused. You have to you have to as the investor assess the government, the climate, the environment, the prospects, 
and there isn't a larger environment that you're a larger markets environment <coughs> which you're operating is that fair to say that you're you're going project by project a lot of times yeah big time and it's a real problem yeah. and it's project by project on financing it's project by project on regulatory it's project by project on, and it's and one of the discussions we've had in another group is what can we do to standardize at least within a country to make it easier to invest and 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 is there a way to get from the investors what are they looking for everybody says there's a ton of money out there but there's not bankable projects everybody says there's bankable projects there's no money <laughs> so somewhere there's a connection point yeah I, th I think the disconnection on that is clearly in scale I mean we're building a 450 million dollar oil services terminal for the oil industry in Ghana. Ghana is politically acceptable. Uh, people see it as the sort of best economy in West Africa. Uh, it's the oil industry. Your clientele are all big blue chip oil companies. And everybody's bending over backwards to say, how much do you want? We'll give you a check for 50, 100, whatever. Where I think Africa really struggles is SME funding. So I think young <coughs> entrepreneurs with a great idea can probably find some money to get the great idea up running and working. But when they're looking for sort of uh, between 5 and, and 15 million right. growth capital to actually build the business and put it on a proper commercial footing and then take it to market, etc., it's that middle gap that it's, that's missing. And the problem with international institutions is they don't want to write a check that small. Mm -hmm. in, in, I think going back to Jay's point, there's lots of institutional um, investor appetite to partake in Africa growth and the African growth story. But they want to write a check for $10 million. It's not worth the admin for them below 10. Some are 50, some are 100. And the, the, the real necessity is to fill that sort of uh, 5 to $15 million gap that actually builds those businesses into a size when they can say, great, we're going to list this on the exchange, and you've got a normal functioning financial system. Where, where is a way, where, where's the best prospect of developing more of that in a market sense? I mean, there was a lot of thought that South Africa would become more of that than I think it, maybe it has at this point. Yeah. What, what, what gets, what fills that gap? What has to happen to, to, to get there? Yeah, Matt, it's tough. There's 23, I believe, stock exchanges on the continent. Of those 23, perhaps, arguably a dozen are functional. Yeah. Uh, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, obviously, most sizable would account for, I'm guessing, maybe two-thirds plus of all portfolio investment flows. So the biggest challenge, and I agree with what we said now, is that the shallow capital markets are certainly you know, an obstacle. But it's also not just that, it's also culture. And Jeff mentioned it now, is that we have this, this relatively very deep capital market in South Africa, but again, to, to access relatively small entrepreneurial finance is very, very difficult. It's a cultural thing. How do we shift that and become more entrepreneurial, more capitalist, even sort of a U.S. sort of, or even a Chinese approach in terms of how to, to, to raise capital for, for entrepreneurial ideas, mobilizing capital around an idea? It's, um, I don't know what the solution is. I honestly don't know. We've tried various institutions in, in South Africa, and I don't think we've got there. Can I ask, uh, can I ask any of you if you have, um, Michael mentioned the, the doctor of, uh, phone app. Are there things you've seen that work as young ideas when we talk about the heat map? Are there particular provocative things that come to mind for any of you that you, you look at and you say, this is the model, this is something that worked, here's something that gets me very excited. Any things that people could take away from that you... Yeah, I, you know, I, there's another application in uh, that I think it's KPLC maybe doing, but where in, in some of the slums they can fundamentally through the mobile technology rent rent power by the hour. I mean, that's pretty pretty dramatic when you think about it. So if you have enough money on your phone, you can dial in and get a light to study or do whatever you need to do. So, and that's being, I think, They can tested. definitely deliver the power. Well, it's done through, yeah, they, they have the capability to provide the security and things like that. And it's, and it's not like typically you sign in a contract and it comes to your house. It's, it's more of a community one. We're working with a group um, uh, called Habahut, we're going to launch it next week, uh, Habahut in Kenya, where we basically have a filtration and a membrane, and you're able to, to buy water uh, and then re redo it with the solar power, and again, and then microfinance the owner um, from a standpoint of letting he or she, you know, basically build a business out of that. And so it's, you know, clean water is key in a lot of, in, in, and so that's, that's another way. So there's a lot of smaller ways that what you can do with 
the technology, the mobile technology infrastructure that's been put out there, I think. Uh, one other area that we've seen, the brewers do this the best in Africa, is, is to actually use their relationships and their balance sheets to, f to create access to finance for uh, companies along their, along their food chain. So where one, one area that's worked very well is where the, the, the brewers would, would negotiate with the banks to have the distribution agents mm -hmm. have access to finance on negotiated rates. And there's, they don't provide, the, the, the brewers don't provide the balance sheet, they, but they provide the support to the banks to enable them to do that. And what that does in terms of creating a mushroom effect on the number of brewer, or distributors that can, that can actually play in the market and the employment that that creates, et cetera, is another model that could be rolled out in different sectors and in, different, in more countries. I think these sort of campaigns are, are really, really useful for driving growth. I mean, one of the things, we, we distribute John Deere tractors in five countries uh, in Africa, and we're just putting a program together. We trialed it in Mozambique very successfully, and we're just expanding it on that. But what we've put together, we've bundled a, a bundle of equipment together as the John Deere distributor, mm -hmm. and John Deere are very supportive of this and, and local banks, and we bundle together $35,000 worth of agricultural equipment, everything you basically need to go from a subsistence farmer to gearing up to become a technology or, or a... Uh, an equipment-aligned uh, farmer. And what we've put together is a package uh, with various elements and support from third parties where you can get $35,000 worth of equipment, little tractor, a plow, a harrow, etc., for $5,000. Mm. So friends and family can get together. If you can come up with $5,000, you can become a mechanized farmer, mm. which just transforms your ability to produce um, which in my turn then gives you viable volumes that you can produce to hit that <coughs> threshold that you need to be able to make the logistics work to deliver your product to market is, 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 rather than sell it at the end of your farm door. Is a model like that something you could see applying to other kinds of uh, industries or, or equipment or, or anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a whole range of, of uh, applications for exactly the same sort of concept. We've got a little over 20 minutes, so I want to open up to questions uh, for people out there, if there's anyone who'd like to, uh, to weigh in. Uh, do you want to go? I know you, so um, stand up, and I think you should, we have a mic coming, and you should uh, uh, introduce yourself and your affiliation. Peter Wanakot with the Wall Street Journal. This question could be for anyone on the panel. Uh, I'm wondering if, if there's a, dem um, a democratic dividend for African markets. Uh, do businesses reward countries where there are peaceful transitions to power? Uh, or it, are political systems irrelevant to the decisions you make? Thank you. Who wants to take uh, that one? From, from, <laughs> from my perspective, um, politics are politics. Obviously, uh, a nice democracy is a, a nice democracy. The main constraint, <laughs> the, the main constraint I say in, in every environment, all the 18 countries we work in, is from a commercial perspective, you need a, a standard playing field. Just don't keep moving the goalposts. I write a feasibility study, I invest in a project, I build a, a company in your country uh, on a certain amount, on a, on a criteria of financial understanding. And if halfway through that product project the goalposts move, then it, it makes me very unattractive as an investor. Uh, it, that's what causes the issues. The, from a, a commercial perspective, if you're working in, a, in an environment that is stable and you understand the, the commercial requirements, then you can invest. If the commercial requirements keep moving for whatever, sta for whatever reasons, it just becomes in, impossible to budget and forecast what your budget is going to do. I think there is a dividend, and the dividend is in you get more investment, you get it relatively cheaper, you may not have to do a sovereign guarantee. When you're looking at it as an investor, political stability, I mean, it, political stability is a broad term. It doesn't necessarily mean there aren't going to be changes in administrations and parties and all that. What it means is that, as Jeff said, how we're going to do business and the rule of law there doesn't change as new elections occur and new administrations come in. So the deal that we we did with the current government on a utility plant supplying power and, and we invested in that. And that continues through the next administration or whoever is in power. That's the key. And to me, cost of funds go down because the risk quotient is lower. 
So that's to me, is how I would look at the dividend. Martin, I want to ask you a question because I, I want to ask you to address this through one lens, if you don't mind, the Chinese lens, because you understand the Chinese very well. They're the biggest FDI investor on the continent. How do they see this issue, do you think? Mm. Just to add, first of all, Peter says, I mean, it's wrong to equate democratic process with good governance. And we all know, have our own examples here. And I see many of you shaking your heads, agreeing. Um, I think the unintended, um, unintended impact from Beijing of its engagement in Africa has been uh, the attempt by various African states, and this has been enabled particularly post-September 2008 with discrediting of this generic Western sort of model, Bretton Woods driven sort of model in, in the minds of many African leaderships is the attempt to implement a often difficult to understand China model in our continent, including South Africa. Um, for many, this, would, um, this is not always comfortable when one looks at it through a traditional Western lens. However, I think for me what's important is, and moving away from the sort of democratic process as a, somehow resulting automatically in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a developmental dividend, I think what ultimately counts here, regardless of political system, it's the caliber, it's not how they got there, it's the caliber of personality of the leader ultimately, and the developmental focus that leadership has. It's not about the process. And if that, if the, 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 the firstly I'd say there is no China model. There isn't a China model of development. It's a series of very pragmatic focused steps the leadership has taken over a very long extended period of time. But it's exactly that. It's about policy consistency, pragmatic implementation of policy by strong institutions. It's going for growth, ignoring perhaps other things in the process, striving for growth. That effectively is the model. Let me ask one thing, and then we'll take other questions, which is this is very quick and probably a little bit shallow on my part. But when you, all of you seem to have agreement about the governmental stability, policy, um, some, some consistency, even uh, uh, as changes in government. Can you name me one or two places that stand out in your minds on the continent under those, uh, under those um, uh, circumstances? Countries now? Yeah. Um, I think countries that are, that are sort of, and again, look, don't, this is not a political statement, yeah. this is just a, an objective <laughs> view, is countries that are, um, you know, that are more developmentally focused, and, and I would argue that, and put this in context, the um, countries that are best, that are thinking strategically around the new world, the new world, China-centric world, which countries in Africa are thinking about this consciously, aligning their, their own developmental strategies around this enabling macro force. I think undoubtedly Ethiopia is never top of the list. I think uh, Rwanda has mentioned previously, politics aside, Angola, um, politics aside until recently, Sudan, um, South Africa, definitely. So uh, I think, but again, it's, uh, there's, no, there's no set model one should be pursuing here. Ultimately, it comes down to a very effective, disciplined, um, focused institutions. Other panelists, again, speaking apolitically, speaking purely under the terms, I think, Jeffrey Lee. I, I think top of my list currently would be Ghana. Um, I think you get a great sense when you're doing business in Ghana of long-term <laughs> continuity and an economy that's going to continue to grow and a, a population that is, is very clear on stability and, and uh, the future. Um, Rwanda, uh, Ghana, and Ethiopia for me. Mm. I disagree on Angola. I don't think Angola is being as strategic as it could be. Uh, anyone, do you want to add anything there? Um, no, I would say, you know, it's to, to us, it's where, you know, there's a thriving business community with a stability, and I think the, the countries they mention, I think, I think Kenya, uh, even with the political issues from 07, 08, continued business-wise, continued to go, and I think that's been important, but Rwanda, all the others um, that have already been mentioned. Michael. I think my view is that, uh, I think the political solution in Kenya, is, sorry, is political uh, scenario or framework in, uh, in Africa is not like instant coffee where you just <laughs> put coffee and hope that you probably get an instant <laughs> solution. I don't think that's the point. I think, they, I think uh, 
Each country has its, has its own dynamics. For instance, I have an office in Zimbabwe. Everybody asks me, how can you go to Zimbabwe? I say, I like Zimbabwe. There's a great opportunity. When I walk the streets, I see opportunity. There's a big opportunity in that market. Why is it that global banks, some of them are still there, years later, despite all the mayhem? But when I, I don't see mayhem, I see opportunity. So I'm more of an entrepreneur. I take an entrepreneurial look in any sector I go to and say, look, Nigeria has its challenges, but the opportunity is immense. So I look at, when I make investment decisions and go to markets, I, don't, I look at a combination of one, how, where do I see my business going? Two, do I see, can I make revenue and, and, and sustain profits? And can I make extraordinary profits? And third is, how can I, whatever, whatever, what kind of relationships do I have in that market that enable me to succeed? And think, that's how I look at it. So I wouldn't really say that there's a country that I favor. If I would like to say I favor Kenya, I'm Kenyan, right? I build my business in Kenya. And uh, they are, all countries have got different dynamics. You, you wanted to add one yeah, thing? Yeah, just, we haven't mentioned Zimbabwe. And um, I would argue that, you know, with a final political resolution, it may come about through an act of God, perhaps. But in the medium term, Zimbabwe... The ultimate stability, I think, is the... Uh... In the medium term, I would argue, Zimbabwe, you'll have sort of UK government, European stabilisation fund, you'll have, you'll have um, you know, significant infrastructure spend, foreign direct investment going to the country, South African capital waiting, literally, to, you know, to go into Zimbabwe. And perhaps most importantly, and a big loss for us, is returning Zimbabwean talent back to Zimbabwe. We're in the medium term... Potentially, Zimbabwe could be one of the fastest, best-performing economies on this continent. Other, sorry, sir, right there. My name is James Nyoro from the Rockefeller Foundation. One of the sectors we haven't really talked about much is the business process outsourcing, and where we see that uh, particular as a potential for job creation in Africa. Because with your investments. I think we need to consider that youth badge is an opportunity and a threat at the same time, particularly being driven by technology. So what would be your comments? Uh, BPO, my, my, my take on BPO. First, uh, we as in our own markets don't consume BPO. We're expecting that, 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 that international customers consume, consume our services as, as a BPO industry. It's us to start with our, in our own markets consuming BPO services. An example, if the government, to, to a large extent, was to create a citizen service center, a large platform where, government, where citizens can be able to, to seek information, as opposed to having long queues in various government offices, that in itself would create 10,000 BPO jobs. Now, I think we need to start there first, before we go out there and try, start requesting people to invest in us. And second, is also leveraging Leverage in value. For instance, if GE is setting up shop in Kenya, and for instance, I know they have a BPO facility in, uh, in uh, one of their global presences, probably in, in uh, Philippines, I'm not sure they do, but any other place, I would insist, if they're selling me planes, okay, as a government, I would insist that part of their, their BPO business be brought to Kenya or be brought to, to, to Zambia. Because then it's sort of an exchange, because it's, 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 it's negligible, but it already starts getting that BPO industry having an, inter an international standard. Now, if you take a BPO entrepreneur, tell him to go to G and, 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 and lobby for a BPO transaction, I think it will take him a long time, on a very, very long period of time, to try and get that contract uh, awarded to him. So I think it's a combination between... You're doing a good job of lobbying right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, uh, right there. Uh, yes, you, sir. Yes. Uh, two very quick comments. My name is Joseph Mora from KPMG in East Africa. One on this uh, political um, comment. Um, I think we also need to understand Africa in context. And just giving an example, if the campaign discourse that is going on in the U.S. now was happening anywhere in Africa, that country would be reported to be on the verge of civil war. Um, and I, I, I think we just need to understand the maturity curve of that. Um, secondly, in terms of just the opportunity, uh, we've talked about the natural resources, the land mass, the water, and everything there is. Uh, but when you look at Africa um, and the population being enriched, being unfed, being underserved, being uh, uncared for, uh, being unbanked, um, many of uh, international investors look at that as sort of a pitiful situation. But there's a huge opportunity in that. 
If you look at the transformation of telecoms in Kenya, um, when we were looking at the model, initially we were looking at um, Vodafone um, achieving about 500,000 in three years. They did that in three months because of the unreached and served uh, population. So whether you're looking at education, whether you're looking at health, whether you're looking at even civil society, um, there are huge opportunities in terms of uh, reaching um, uh, the underserved and, and, and the uncared for. And we need to leverage four key issues. I think technology uh, provides opportunities for health, for education, for banking, and, and we can't come in with traditional models. Secondly, the middle class, the emerging middle class within, within the continent. Uh, thirdly, the, the youthful population and the educated youthful population and their entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and finally, the whole issue of community and cooperation. Uh, that you're not looking at individuals as one, uh, you're looking at uh, communities and how you can organize those communities to be uh, uh, viable consumers. Thank you. Did, does anyone want to respond to any of that? And particularly, I think if I'm, if I'm uh, summarizing right, you know, the, 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 the degree to which there is a, for all we talked about training, which we talked about earlier, there's a large ready to work population that might respond well to certain projects and certain investment. Does anybody have any thoughts particularly on that or, or any of the other remarks? I, th I think the only thing I would, I would respond on that is uh, I accept that and I think it's coming and foreign direct investment is coming. You've got really strong economic growth. What I think helps that process that Africa as a whole is very bad at just now and I, I think this sort of forum is very helpful is selling Africa to the world. Africa is still, the media coverage of Africa is still inclined to be the negative sides of what's going on and there has to be a, a far more harder push to get a positive image of Africa and Africa Africa growing and the good news that's in Africa, of which there's lots, um, out to the world and the global market, and I think that that's part of the solution, or part of the part of the speeding up of the process. Yeah, from a perception point of view, uh, recently we were in a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting with one of the large private equity investors invest in Africa, and they were saying, "Look, why should I invest in Africa?" And we realized that a lot of comments was to do something to do with perception. Companies that are successful in Africa don't go out there and say they're successful. They don't go and say we made 400 times uh, our, our money. Uh, you know a lot of these companies, they don't go out there and celebrate and say that Africa is a place to be. I'm not sure if they do that because they intend not to tell other people that there's a place, magic, uh, there's, some, there's some honey here, or I'm not sure what's, what the issue is, but <coughs> naturally perception out there should, can actually be changed by companies who come here and give case studies of how they've been able to, 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 to increase their revenues and also be profitable in this market. Mm -hmm. I, you're talking about companies at talking about Africa. I, I think Africans need to do a lot more about discussing the resource potential, the opportunity sets, and also the success stories. Uh, there, there, are, there is a large number of companies that are making more in Africa than they're making in their home countries. And we're not hearing about those. And we need to court those types of companies more we need to demand from them things like skills development, capital, agriculture, all the key areas that we need, and give them a good reason to come and engage with us. And it has to start from us. Yes, sir. Uh, Mark Belkin, Hasso Platinum Ventures from uh, Cape Town. The one thing I haven't heard today is uh, any form of discussion around entrepreneurship. The skills development discussion is really interesting and really important, but for, my, for me, it would be a far more sustainable long-term relationship if large international businesses like GE were to come to countries and help to develop an entrepreneurial class. Michael is a very important example. We know about Michael's business. We've engaged Michael. And we'd like to see many more Michaels out there. It's great to train more employees for your businesses, but what we'd really like to do is leave something sustainable, which is um, an entrepreneurial class to develop businesses on an ongoing basis and actually potentially grow out of the African market. Our model is to invest in those businesses so that they can uh, uh, grow out of the African market, grow into some of the other emerging markets, grow into the developed world, 
it makes a big difference. And I wondered if anybody wanted to comment on that. Right, Jay, sure. I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to do it in the context of, since we already did, but probably in the context of the fact that as GE has globalized in the last decade, I know the country of uh, the company has put more research centers, hired more local engineers, and made that an emphasis. Do you, do you, is that something yeah, you can see here? Yeah. I think I think you'll look at it two ways. <clears throat> One is um, obviously we want to hire, we want to build a base here, or a bigger base here. Um, we're going to continue to hire people. I mentioned earlier we're going to put in you know investments in service shops, uh, training facilities around that, uh, potential assembly, you know, m mirror what we've done in South Africa on the assembly uh, plants. So, but the bigger impact that we can make, I mean, we can hire 4,000 people, but the bigger impact is the supply chain, all right? And that's where entrepreneurs, SMEs, that, that's, and so what we're, we've brought in two people to work on nothing but supply chain, uh, as I said, we run about 40 to 50 percent local content on the locomotives we assemble in South Africa. And the biggest issue we have there is, again, to develop a strong supply chain. And not just in, you know, metal bending, you know, at moving up the, the technical ladder, if you will, and to electromechanical devices, et cetera. So those are the things that we want to do is build out, because then we get a multiplicative effect of every one job that we do here or one product that we make here you know, has a lot more, and they then can leverage that and go out to other companies. So that's kind of how we're looking at it. We, we have just a couple of minutes left, so I want to just take it back to all of you up here um, and have each of you, if you can just take a minute or so to uh, <clears throat> sort of sum up. Uh, this has been a great discussion, by the way. It's really been enjoyable. We've covered a lot of topics today in a lot of areas. But when you look at uh, FDI here, when you look at the state of it, when you think about it as investors, and each of you, in the context of what we've talked about today, give us just one or two takeaways to think about about where, where the continent should be going. Do you want to start? Uh? Thanks, Matt. Um, for me, sort of the highlights are, and it was touched upon, maybe Kenyan Airways was mentioned as the, as the exception. African states typically are unable to manage um, companies. The trend must be towards liberalization. We're not, we cannot with maybe very, very few exceptions. We can't be doing a Singapore in, um, in Africa. I think secondly is, um, you know, the opportunity for key sectors arises from first mover advantage, the consolidation effect. Sectors I see that taking place in is retail right now, obviously the sort of mass mart, Walmart story, the, the ShopRite checker story, logistics coming up undoubtedly, um, healthcare slash hospitals, and most certainly, certainly private education. I think that's a phenomenal opportunity in the continent. Um, the new Africa, we often comparing ourselves to the likes of India and China, but unlike India and China, Africa does not have the sheer intensity of domestic competition that those two other economies have. And I think that's extremely attractive to, to new entrants or companies coming into, uh, into, into the continent. And certainly the trend going forward will be countries that, companies that are not so-called becoming, you know, emerging multinational corporations going out, taking on the world, but sort of intra-regional uh, emerging multinationals, African multinationals, companies that are stepping across borders, uh, taking advantage of these trends of regional liberali liberalization in their respective regions. And very lastly is that um, I would argue that, you know, in a perverse way, the sort of Western economic slowdown, stagnation, if you will, in a perverse manner, it may be positive for this continent because ultimately capital will seek growth. <clears throat> and without that domestic intensity of competition I mentioned in Asia particularly, I think Africa, there'll be, it'll result in a, in a medium term shift mm. in mindset from traditional investors seeing Africa as a commercial opportunity rather than previously perhaps a developmental burden. Jeff, and I'm, I'm right. being signaled in the back that time is running short. I, so. I suspect as we go to the left, we're going to be more and more repetitive, so Michael <laughs> will be short of things. Like, um, I, I think uh, a couple of things that I would just point out. One is this idea of a, of a subtle change where from an oil and gas and a mineral perspective and definitely from an agricultural perspective, you've got this change from Africa needing the world to the world needs Africa um, and the world economies and the world's uh, in industries are getting more and more focused that Africa is absolutely vital for their long-term growth. In the world by 2050, can't feed itself. Uh, 
a big part of that solution is, is going to be African agriculture going to the global marketplaces. So that, that's, that's one aspect. And the other aspect, I think, is, is back to this idea that um, Jay touched on. People need to understand, and I think Michael touched on it, people need to understand how positive Africa is as a market to invest in. It's not like the rest of the world that is, is slowing down. I don't spend my life in Lonro's businesses trying to steal 1% market share from my competitors. I'm typically in a market that's growing 10, 20, even 30% a year. So I'm just absorbing that demand to grow my business um, rather than in a Western model saying, great, GE stole 1% from BAE. Um, that's been a great success. The reality is the opportunities are there in Africa. More people just need to understand them. Quickly, quickly, because I'm being I'm, signaled about time management. Okay, I'm, I, just, just so I don't repeat what everyone else was saying, just I'll answer one of the questions that was raised earlier. Uh, one of the areas that we focus on in Renaissance Capital is on the middle, the mini dangotes, the next set of entrepreneurs who, are, who do have the potential not just to be African conglomerates, but actually global conglomerates and be on the same scale. Um, and at Renaissance Capital, we provide the advice, we provide the research around them and, and help them raise capital to do that. Uh, and that's, that's part of the story that we have. I would sum it up quickly in that we've, we all know enough about the African demographics and the growing middle class. It's time to get speed and execution in getting the infrastructure and the capabilities of the continent to basically, uh, you know, get that, that demographics to be a positive. I think I'll just summarize by saying that uh, recently saw a map of Africa on it that superimposed the U.S. On the, in, in, uh, in West Africa that superimposed India from South Africa upwards, part of India and the sec second section of India that superimposed France in, uh, in North Africa, that superimposed Eastern Europe in Egypt. And out of that, most of Europe, uh, part, of a part of Asia, and also China was also superimposed on that map. And I said, wow. The whole world is sort of, sort of somehow superimposed on Africa. <laughs> so it's a big opportunity because Africa, that's the opportunity that is available. And I'm, the five things is to say, look, if you're coming to invest in Africa, you need to arrive early and take a long-term view. I think most of us sometimes don't take a long-term view. We need to be, build relationships in whatever you do because people, as you mentioned about entrepreneurship and partnerships, you need partnerships to excel. You need to be vigilant, definitely. As you invest, there definitely risk. You need to manage your risks. And also, you need to also diversify your project portfolio. Because sometimes you, 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 you overinvest in one area and leave another area. So you need to find ways to divest in multiple areas. That's what I would say. Thank you. Okay. Sorry to run over. Thank you all very much for a terrific discussion today. Really good to have you. Thank you. Thank you.